here for me to click recording in progress. Um, so uh, this is being recorded. We are hoping to put this meeting on uh, the uh, website so anybody who can't attend tonight can view it um, and uh, be able to participate. So uh, next slide. And we'll go one more. Again, this is uh, focused on the inv invasive species management uh, management plan. This has been developed by a, a team of folks. Uh, there is a, a steering committee of Long Lake residents who've been uh, working on this, but also we have uh, Commissioner Garrido and myself. Jennifer Haro was working on this for a while. Unfortunately, Jennifer Haro is uh, no longer with us. Unfortunately, no one misses her more than me. And then um, this grant, uh, we went out for a request for proposal for uh, contractors to, to develop this plan for us. Tetra Tech uh, was the only submission and they are of course a fabulous team as well. Um, and we utilize them, which includes the team of Harry Gibbons, Shannon, and then uh, Tony um, it, to uh, kind of help us kind of work some of these things out. So. With that, um, uh, Shannon and um, Harry, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Shannon Bradabo, and I am an environmental engineer and limnologist uh, with Tetra Tech. Uh, I live in Spokane, but uh, started my career at Tetra Tech in the Seattle office. Um, and then I'll briefly introduce uh, Tony Pennington. She um, is our or is an aquatic invasive plant expert and she's with the firm uh, ESA and she provided um, QA QC of the plan and also uh, her expertise in um, new and developing uh, management strategies and technologies and really pro provided a lot of um, expert advice and opinions as we wrote the plan. Harry, Harry you want to go ahead? Okay, uh, Harry Gibbons, uh, a lot of you know me. I've been working on the lake for a couple decades, actually three. Um, did my first aquatic plant survey at Long Lake in the 90s, and right after um, Mary Beth, my better half and I, uh, put together the first uh, edition of the Integrated Aquatic Vegetation Management Plan for Ecology back in the 90s. So, um, I've been doing this uh, for a few years for Long Lake, but all over the country actually. Um, and uh, it's exciting to see things change and try to make things happen. So I thank everybody. Fantastic. Okay, uh, Shannon, it's all yours. All right. All right, I feel like Eric kind of already did a great job uh, describing, giving you a little bit of background, but um, I'll give you a, a little bit more background about um, the Long Lake. Uh, it's called an IAVMP, which stands for Integrated Aquatic Vegetation Management Plan. And as uh, Eric mentioned, um, this plan, or the county uh, applied for and was successfully awarded a planning grant from the Department of Ecology to develop this plan. And the Department of Ecology actually has a really great program. Um, it's an aquatic plant management program and it was started back in the early 1990s. And it's funded from a fee that is attached to the annual registration of boat trailers. Um, and so that's how they fund the program. And each year they have about $350,000 uh, to um, award to various different projects. Um, for this project, for the planning part, um, the grant award limit is $30,000. And the, the thought is, is that um, you get this grant first, you write a plan, Ecology reviews and approves the plan, and then allows you to um, go after and apply for grant money under, um, in the same program, but under the implementation, which is a little bit uh, higher of an amount. So. Um, as Eric mentioned, this uh, the IAVMP addresses aquatic vegetation management only um, and uh, focuses on uh, plants and uh, not algae. And um, Harry mentioned this as well. There has been a previous uh, plan uh, completed for Long Lake, and that was done in uh, 1997. And, um, you know, the reason why the county chose to go after grants was because Long Lake, unfortunately, has dense aquatic plants. 
um, and it's caused a problem. It's been historically a problem in the lake and it's, it's um, caused uh, quite a few issues with recreation and, and uh, enjoyment of the lake over the last few years. So um, just a little bit of background, again, um, kind of explaining the process. Uh, the Department of Ecology does have a manual. And so this plan was developed following the guidance of the manual. And you know, one of the first steps is you have to map the invasive species. And um, fortunately for Long Lake, um, the annual surveying of the aquatic plants in the lake was part of the lake management district. And so we had a really good understanding of the aquatic plant species in Long Lake. And we used both the May, the spring and fall 2021 plant surveys to guide this plan. And so you take that information that you have from the lake and the um, current coverage and density of the species, you form a steering committee, uh, which included um, uh, six to eight members of the community and lake residents. And you work with that steering committee to develop a problem statement and management goals. And then those management goals are what you use to develop a draft plan and evaluate different management methods. And finally, um, come to the conclusion or proposal of which management, method, which management methods would be the best for Long Lake. And then after you develop the plan, you obtain community feedback. So that's where we are right now. Uh, Jennifer and Eric posted the uh, draft plan as well as a longer version of this presentation on the website. And we're hosting this public meeting in hopes of getting your community feedback that we will then in turn take and incorporate into the plan, finalize the plan. And then of course the ultimate goal is to implement the plan. So it's a very um, uh, detailed process. And uh, this document, the citizen's manual um, for developing this plan is available on Ecology's website. If anybody is looking for a good read, you know, and the late hours of the day. Um, it's, it's a good document and it provides a lot of guidance. So that's how this plan came to be. Uh, just briefly, I just wanted to um, thank the, the steering committee for volunteering their time and participating in the process. Um, this uh, graphic shows a timeline. It may be hard to read. Um, but you know, we had a kickoff meeting with the steering committee in February of this year. So this is quite a lengthy process to get to a draft plan. There's, there's lots of moving parts, lots of moving pieces. And at that kickoff meeting, the steering committee did a great job of drafting a problem statement and started the goal setting process. Um, in April and May of this year, the problem statement and management goals were finalized by the steering committee and shared with the community. Uh, in June, we had a second meeting with the steering committee. We uh, used that meeting to, to review and refine uh, plant management alternatives. Uh, in August, the draft plan was complete and reviewed by the county and members of the steering committee. And then here we are now, October, November, um, where the draft plan is being reviewed by the public. There's a public comment period and we will finalize the plan in November and send it to Ecology for review. Um, I believe the application period for the implementation grant ends either the beginning of December or mid of December, mid December. And so we got um, the go ahead from the Department of Ecology that even though we don't have a finalized plan, we have a plan in draft form, uh, the county can go ahead and apply for that implementation grant using the draft plan. So that's very helpful because this is a lengthy process involves a lot of um, a lot of steps and a lot of people. So with that, um, I am going to have Harry take over for a little bit and talk about uh, aquatic plants, the benefits of aquatic plants, and uh, the um, issues with invasives. Go ahead, Harry. Well, a lot of this will be kind of review for folks and those that uh, you might have a few pieces of new information that we'll, we'll whip through this fairly fast. Essentially, um, the benefits of native aquatic plants uh, is that they enhance the ecosystem. They uh, provide uh, an enhanced uh, habitat for
for multiple species, fish, invertebrates, birds, uh, and many other species, including bacteria and, and fungi that are a part of the process. They also, a balanced uh, native plant community provides water quality improvement by net production of oxygen and uh, sequestering pollutants and nutrients so that nutrients don't recycle and grow algae that are also a, a problem with over fertilization and over availability of it. So it's, uh, it's a good thing. The other thing about native plants is they have control upon them in terms of their density and uh, <clears throat> their coverage, um, you know, in terms of competition. So they've had several species try to fight and uh, have their habitat and, and do that. They, have, they are a food source. A lot of things eat the plants and, and use them as habitat too, and that kind of diminishes their growth pattern. Uh, they're also limited by the nutrient and light cycle. So those two things are, are a limiting factor that naturally control uh, aquatic na native aquatic plants if there's not too much nutrient availability. Next slide. Yeah. Unlike the native aquatic plants, invasive aquatic plants uh, are uh, often create nuisance condition in lake particularly because they break down the, that ecosystem balance, that natural control doesn't exist for them. So they displace, first of all, they displace the native plants, try to grow all by themselves, and they grow too dense uh, without limiting factors. They just keep growing and getting denser and denser. Uh, so they totally destroy habitat in all sectors. All the food chain is totally uh, disrupted by their presence. They degrade water quality. Instead of providing oxygen, they consume oxygen and actually create more organic material that consumes more oxygen. So the oxygen level decreases. They produce organic material that decays and releases compounds that overall decay and or diminish the aquatic uh, water quality of the lake. They mobilize nutrients because of their existence in the organic process and things. They actually take nutrients that are historically bound in the sediment and help bring them about to the open water to grow more algae and result in algal problems as well as feeding themselves so that they can produce more organic material. Um, so uh, they all, that's the other thing is they produce a lot of organic material. That organic material drops to the sediment during the year, creates slime <laughs> and and fills in the lake. So it, it, it in time, destroys the habit, the whole beneficial uses of that lake. And the other thing is, because they're non-native, there's no natural control available to, to limit the factors. They're too aggressive for all the native plants and take control. Next slide. So what we have is, if you have a diverse native uh, environment that's balanced, a balanced ecosystem like the picture in A, you, you don't have that density, that plant thick density. And so you create an atmosphere, uh, an environment that allows multiple species of, of animals and bacteria and other plants and stuff to exist and coexist and overlap. And that has a diversity that uh, enhances the overall food chain as well as the overall presence and stability of the water quality. Because of their density and their growth, native plants that aren't too thick, they produce a net amount of oxygen, so they help create oxygen near the sediment, so that helps control the nutrients. They also sequester, because of that, a lot of the uh, pollution that occurs, so they're a plus plus. In contrast to that is B, when you have non-native plants, they like to grow by themselves. They, they grow so dense, they crowd out all the native species and they fight with, with them for dominance or with other invasive species. So they grow too dense. That limits the overall habitat. It destroys the habitat. It reduces the water quality because they're so dense, there's so much organic material. Their respiration consumes the oxygen. Then when they die back and sequester and stuff, reduces, it consumes oxygen. So it reduces the water quality by reducing oxygen and producing compounds that are not good. It also 
changes the chemistry of the sediment water interface that can lock up nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, and it actually activates the release from deeper sediments that have historically been locked into the water column. That they use to themselves to grow more organic material, but it also can grow algae and cause algae blooms, and particularly toxic algae blooms, and that's something we don't want to do. The other big problem is non-native plants produce so much organic material, they produce so much slime, they fill in the lake. They virtually accelerate the aging process of a lake to change it from open water to, to a wetland to dry land. And there is no basic control that goes after them in mother nature because there's no competition for them. So having a management option with us is the only way to control non-native. Shannon, I guess you're the next slide. Yeah. All right. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we used the aquatic plant uh, survey results from 2021, which was a combination of a survey done in the spring and in the fall. And based on that survey, um, the lake, I mean, it's not all bad news. The, the lake currently has an increased diversity of native species um, compared to conditions in the 1990s and mid 2000s, uh, and especially in the 90s when Brazilian Elodea covered 90 to 95% of the entire lake. Um, Harry tells me that um, Brazilian Elodea was pretty much everywhere in the lake, super thick, very solid, except for the deep trench. So I feel like there has been some progress, there has been some progress made on the control of um, these invasive species and and there are more native species, but there is still, um, as I'm sure you all are aware of, and while you're attending this meeting, there is still some significant dense plant growth in the majority of the lake, in the littoral areas, which is those shallow areas um, along the shorelines. Um, but again, so there have been historically um, non-native invasive species in Long Lake. And uh, one of those, Eurasian water milfoil, um, has fortunately, we have not observed and was not observed during the 2021 surveys. So the management methods that uh, you have implemented over the several decades have, have worked to control that one um, non-native invasive plant. Uh, the curly leaf pondweed was only found in some scattered patches. And of course, the Brazilian Elodea, um, which is found in, in the majority of the lake, has um, greatly reduced from those uh, from the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, so again, quick, you know, just quickly, this map is incredibly hard to read. Um, I do know that it is on the Lake Management District website and included in some of the annual um, reports. And uh, but so the the big green piece in the middle of the lake, that is Brazilian Elodea or um, Agaria densa is its scientific name. And that is your dominant non-native submerged plant. Um, the fragrant water lily is in those, those big orange sections um, and pink sections at the south end and the north end and along some of the shorelines. Um, that is the invasive water lily that has um, we've seen the most expansion um, from and has some incredible dense coverage, especially down in the south end. Uh, the curly leaf pondweed is another non-native plant. Um, it is, you will notice it, it has real crispy looking leaves. Um, and in 2021, that coverage was pretty minimal. You also, um, Long Lake is fortunate also to have very dense native <laughs> aquatic plants. Um, there was dense coverage of the white-stemmed pondweed or the Potomagetan prelongus um, in the littoral areas along the shorelines. Again, please, um, if, you, if you would like me to send you this map or um, go to the website, and if you can't find it, we can definitely uh, get this map to you. If you contact me or Eric, uh, I'd be more than happy to send it to you. Uh, just a little bit more about the fragrant water lily or the nymphaea. Um, we unfortunately have seen this plant become a problem in several lakes in Western Washington. 
Uh, we worked on one of these uh, vegetation management plans on Lake Rossiker in Snohomish County. And there the fragrant water lily is doing exactly what it's doing in Long Lake. It's um, taking over, it's um, causing sediment accumulation and accelerating the lake aging process as Harry described. Um, it's reduced the lake's open water area and um, this excessive growth and, and you know, incredible increase in density and coverage is, is, not, um, is really limiting uh, the recreational and beneficial uses of the lake. And unfortunately, I think we'll see this um, for Long Lake and in other lakes in Western Washington, that this lily especially is aggressive and will require you know, significant commitment in its management actions. So um, with that, does anyone have any questions about the plant species that have been found in Long Lake? Um, uh, any particular questions about the, the types of plants um, and their, their life cycles? Uh, there's a lot more information in the plan. Um, it's just a lot of detailed stuff we can't cover in a, in a quick presentation this evening, but we'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. If you're interested, please raise your hand. We'll uh, call on you and you can unmute. All right, no questions. Okay. Moving on. Okay, so this is uh, the next few slides are really going to cover the plan and the planning process. And um, I'm not going to read this slide. <laughs> So the steering committee did an excellent job of drafting and defining the problem statement, which is the very first step in the IAVMP process. And you know, the overarching problem statement is that dense invasive aquatic plants and the excessive growth of those um, native plants have negatively impacted the lake beneficial uses. So um, this dense growth of aquatic plants has impacted navigation, water quality, recreational activities, lake residents and users aren't able to enjoy um, activities that they um, have in the past on the lake. And especially with the fragrant water lily, there is um, a concern that it has led to sediment accretion, you know, decreases in lake depth, and it's accelerated the overall aging of the lake and contributed to um, eutrophication. And um, this problems, these problem statements and then also the management goals that were developed by the steering committee are really the basis for the management plan. Um, and so this, we've taken these problem statements and the key plant species and really tried to come up with a plan to um, help address, address and control some of this um, dense growth of plants. Um, these are the, the, three, the three bad, bad plants on the block, right? The key plant species um, that uh, require management in Long Lake. And, and again, I'll remind everyone that IAVMP process targets invasive non-native plants. So in order to proceed with the state, get approval by the state of the plan and potentially secure funding for implementation, the plan has to target um, invasive non-native species. And so these are the three, the three key plant species in Long Lake. The Brazilian Elodea, which is listed as a noxious weed of concern in Kitsap County, a class B weed on the state noxious weed board. And its approximate coverage based on 2021 was about 225 acres. So a, a significant portion of the lake. Uh, curly leaf pondweed is also um, the invasive non-native plant of concern in Kitsap County. It's a lower um, concern on the state noxious weed board, but still listed as a class C weed. And uh, it was scattered throughout about 15 acres of the lake. And the fragrant water lily, um, it is not listed as a noxious weed of concern in Kitsap County. Um, it is a class C weed, uh, according to the state noxious weed board, and so therefore can be targeted uh, as part of this management plan. And its approximate coverage was about 80 acres in the lake. 
So these are the acreages of the and the key plant species that uh, we in the steering community moved forward with and um, developed our proposed uh, recommendations for um, as part of the plan. Uh, I wanted to throw in a little bit of information about past management efforts at Long Lake. Uh, there are some uh, two really good tables in the plan that summarize both the manual and mechanical methods that have been used in the lake in the past, as well as a table that summarizes um, uh, herbicide use in the lake um, over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, there has been a long history of aquatic plant management as Harry alluded to earlier, um, Brazilian Elodea has been in the lake for well over 40 years. Uh, there was a 20 year study done by the University of Washington in the 1970s through the 1990s. Um, I still work very closely with Dr. Jean Welch, who was at the University of Washington and led most of those studies. And uh, although milfoil was not present, present during those studies, it was observed in that later um, 1997 IAVMP study that Harry mentioned. Um, and then those management efforts that came out of that plan uh, eradicated Eurasian water milfoil from the lake. And we did not observe it in 2021. Um, management with herbicides occurred during 20, uh, 2006, 2010. And that, those management efforts really resulted in a more diverse community and a balanced community of aquatic plant growth. Then, unfortunately, there was a, a gap of several years from 2010 to 2018 where there was no plant management that occurred in Long Lake. Um, and then with the Lake Management District um, forming, management started back up again in 2018. And um, oh, from 2018 until this year, treatments have been mostly herbicide and have focused on uh, native pond weeds as well as the white lily expansion. But um, especially this year, uh, it was limited by budget. Um, I just got back from a conference, the Washington State Lakes Protection Association conference uh, two weeks ago. And the common theme of that conference was, we can't get any herbicide and the costs have doubled. Um, lots of um, homeowners and lake associations have been struggling with their plant management um, this year due to rising costs and um, supply of chemicals and availability of contractors. So um, it's, it's been a struggle. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions about the past management efforts? I don't know much, but Harry's been around a long time. He could probably answer uh, questions if anybody had any. Any questions from the group? Um... Again, raise your hand. Uh, there, again, the hand raise is down there in the reactions button. Um, next to hand clapping, thumbs up, cry laughing, or raise your hand. All right. Okay. So um, as uh, was the case with the problem statement, the steering committee did an excellent job outlining uh, project goals and management goals um, for the plan. Um, the overarching plan goal was to reduce the distribution and density of invasive aquatic plants in Long Lake to support beneficial uses. And there were several objectives to reach that goal, and those are listed um, here in the light blue square you know, including anything, everything from improving recreation and usability, water quality, returning the lake to a balanced ecosystem, improving habitat. Uh, one of the, the, the common themes that came out of our conversations with the steering committee was a desire to educate residents and lake users, both on the spread and convention of aquatic invasive species, but also on available and effective control options that residents and landowners could implement um, themselves in order to support the overall plan. Because um, this is a, a large problem. It's not going to be solved um, in one year for sure. It definitely won't be solved by just one uh, management strategy. And so it's really gonna take the efforts of the community 
um, in order to uh, reach these goals and, uh, and, and reduce the distribution of these invasive plants. And uh, these goals form the basis of the plan and are really what we took and along with the input from the steering committee to develop um, and evaluate different management uh, methods. Uh, so we had plant specific management goals uh, because each plant was a little different and each plant uh, would respond uh, better um, to different uh, control strategies. So for the curly leaf pondweed, uh, the management goal was eradication. Um, because it's, it's not as dense and it's not spread throughout the lake, eradication is achievable. Um, and so the goal became to eradicate the small infestations and continue to monitor the lake to identify any new infestations. This is a plant that if you could stay on top of, you could eradicate it from the lake. Uh, Brazilian Eladia, the management goal was determined to just be control. Um, eradication of Brazilian Eladia, I don't know if it's possible or achievable without um, some, uh, a lot uh, of money and a lot of effort. So the best uh, goal for this plant was to reduce the coverage and density to help promote the native plant growth. And then the fragrant water lily, kind of a similar situation to Brazilian Eladia in that the coverage and density is so thick and, and so large that eradication is most likely impossible. And so the management goal would be to control this and reduce that expansion and reduce the coverage and help to slow the lake aging and the eutrophication process. Um, so again, the, this plan uh, is focused on invasives, but holistically the community um, needs to recognize that given the morphology of the lake or the the bathymetry and the, and the fact that it's a large shallow lake, uh, you could get rid of these invasive non-native species, but then the native species may grow to a point where they could cause nuisance conditions and you may have to manage those native plants as well. And so that's where the continued monitoring and um, adaptive management of the plan comes into play. Becky, did you have a question? I think you're on oh, mute. Okay. There you are. Yeah, I'm just, I'm listening to you and this is all written on paper and the planning and the planning and this and that and the chemicals and the alum, which has been going on for years. And it's like, we're just putting a Band-Aid on it um, year after year after year. And um, I don't know who, where all, the South End has always been like that. And the reason it's getting worse is because people have built down there and they're complaining. We never imagined anybody building on the South End. The park, the North End, it was dredged many years ago when they built the park. And over here by Salmonberry Creek to the um, South Side, that used to be all lily pads and they dredged that. And it's pretty decent now, but <clears throat> for what, I don't know what's been going on for the last five years, but it hasn't gotten any better. And, um, you know, we can keep following you along with everything that's on paper and planning this and planning that, but let's try something different. Um, I mean, Look at the lake in Olympia. I think it's going to cost them $200 million, but who's paying for that? And um, carp, fish, dump a load of carp in here. I know they're expensive, but they eat weeds. Um, what else? Short of dredging and cleaning our own beaches. And like I say, the South End, that's never going to change. Never not without dredging. Okay, that's all I have. To yeah, say. Um, my next slide actually will help address the carp. Um, 
So that is a biological control for aquatic plants. Unfortunately, it cannot be used in Long Lake due to um, the migration of salmonids and the fish uh, regulations by the WDFW. So unfortunately, there are no biological controls that can be applied to Long Lake. So we did, we did look at that for a second and see if it was possible. And um, it's unfortunately not an option for Long Lake. So now, go ahead, Harry, sorry. I, I just wanna also say that I, I have been involved with CARP to use CARP in other lakes to eradicate Eurasian water millfall and it's worked. Uh, but we, in the 90s, we tried to get grass carp as an option when we put the plan together. And uh, as Shannon said, uh, we were shut down because of the permitting uh, and other process. So it's just not, it, it's, it does work, but it's not, and it, but it will not control the white lily. So um, it's, there's no single pill that's available, but uh, yeah. Shannon? Dredging is an option, but dredging has gotten extremely expensive and uh, it just keeps, cost just keeps accelerating uh, dramatically. So it's, that's why the other lake you're talking about is $2 million, $200 million to fix. It costs a lot of money. Sorry, Shannon. Yeah, no, that's all right. So um, this table just summarizes various different control methods that we looked at. And uh, if they targeted the key species of the late, um, key species that we were focused on for this plan, um, there's manual controls, which includes diver hand pulling and cutting. There's um, a, a control technique called DASH or diver assisted suction harvesting. Um, there's landowner and resident hand pulling and cutting, uh, which can be effective uh, in small areas. Uh, we did look at dredging, uh, specifically hydraulic dredging for this lake. Um, the, but there's also there's different types of dredging. Uh, mechanical, we, we looked at different mechanical options like harvesters. Um, unfortunately, with harvesters and weed cutters and anything that cuts the plant, um, curly leaf pondweed and Brazilian Elodea spread by fragmentation. So you, you, while those maybe are good control options for lilies, uh, they are not good control options for the other two plants of concern because um, they will just eventually lead to the spread of those plants. Because um, each little plant, if you just have one little stem or nodule can start a whole new plant. So you have to really be careful about which species of plants that you cut. Um, we also looked at bottom barriers, um, which can be made out of burlap or plastic or some kind of geotextile. There's a, a lake in um, north of Seattle, Lake Ballinger, that has successfully used uh, burlap bottom barriers and uh, hosts workshops for landowners on how to apply those. Um, and then you're, we've got aquatic herbicides. Uh, or in the chemical type of control. So um, there's lots of different control strategies um, and some are applicable to Long Lake and the, the target plant species and some are not. Um, but we did look at uh, quite a few different options and trying to think outside the box a little bit. Um, so um, in the plan, uh, or and I'm sure as you can tell by now, uh, the management alternatives that were evaluated are discussed by plant species. And um, the management options that we looked at were all dependent on the level of control and management goal. Um, so that really, so like for curly leaf pondweed, um, you're not going to suggest a manual control method or a cutting method if your goal is to eradicate because that could just spread the plant even further. Um, and again, uh, the plan presents all of the potential options um, to the community. And um, if you haven't looked through it, or if you have, and you have questions, um, please feel free to ask them during this presentation. And also 
uh, you can send me or Eric an email and uh, we'll make sure that your questions um, get answered to the best that we can answer them. Um, again, just a plug for uh, going into the plan, section eight of the plan um, has a lot of detailed information on all the different plant management alternatives that were considered and also the suite of options that were considered. We, we looked at, um, you know, putting uh, options together in order to get the best bang for the buck. Um, so as I mentioned, if you have any questions um, regarding plant management strategies and why they were not included um, in the um, final proposed um, strategy, please email Eric or me and we can, you know, address your comments or your questions. Um, the, the next slide is going to be a table with a ton of text on it. Um, it's really hard to figure out how to put all this information into a very short presentation. Um, but it's going to talk about, it's going to be the proposed strategy. And the bottom line is, is that the, the proposed plan or what was recommended in the plan is really based off of cost effectiveness. And what management options are available that will give you the best control for the, be the least amount of money. So the best bang for your buck. Um, dredging while is very effective and could target all of the plant species uh, is very, very expensive and um, very hard to permit as well. And so um, we really tried to focus um, the proposed recommendations on cost effectiveness and, and ease of implementation. Uh, so this table um, is, is in the plan. I think it's section nine that goes over um, the proposed plant management strategy. And uh, so for curly leaf pondweed, um, you'll recall that the management goal was eradication of the small infestations of the lake. And the proposed control strategy is uh, manual removal, which would include diver hand pulling um, and annual surveying. And so we think it's possible to eradicate this plant from the lake and um, we'll take ongoing um, management, but we thought that uh, this is the, the best way, most cost-effective way to get it done. Um, it would probably take between three to five days for a diver to uh, survey the lake and hand pull, maybe even a shorter amount of time, depending on the infestation. And then um, annual surveys should be conducted for at least five years post eradication. And the column to the right is the estimated five year cost. And uh, we'll have a slide, a couple of slides um, coming up that really breaks down the costs on year for each management strategy. Um, so, and, and maybe the numbers will be a little bit easier to read. Uh, Brazilian Aladia. The management goal is to control and reduce the coverage to help pr uh, promote native plant growth and diversity. And the most cost-effective way was through herbicide. Um, we recommend treating 25 acres a year, which would be equivalent to 55% of the current coverage over five years. Um, there are rules in the permit uh, that is um, given by the Department of Ecology for any type of plant management um, and chemical application. And there are very um, specific um, acreages that can be treated each year. And the fragrant water lily, we um, did look at two levels of control, an aggressive control a suite of uh, options that would try to target, I think it was 80% reduction and that did include dredging as an alternative, but um, the costs were substantially um, higher. Uh, so this, using the steering committee's inputs and, um, and our recommendation was to target 40 to 50% reduction of the lilies, focusing on that south end of the lake where it's starting to fill in, as well as the high use recreational areas. and. Um, we recommended uh, treating uh, 15 acres annually, two times a year over the five years, rotating your different 15 uh, acres um, with herbicide, but then also really promoting 
the um, engagement with the landowners and residents to do manual hand pulling and cutting. Um, if you hand cut the flowers and seeds and remove them from the lake, that has, um, uh, and if you continue to keep doing that um, year after year, uh, there has been reduction in that uh, Lake Ballinger. Um, also bottom barriers. Um, individual landowners can uh, install bottom barriers and they don't need to get a specific permit if they uh, follow, they can follow the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's um, pamphlet or brochure. And um, I think, Harry, how many acres is it a year that they can put bottom barriers down without a permit? Uh, each individual uh, shoreline owner can put up to uh, half an acre, uh, but it's, it's basically, um, depending on the size of the shore, shoreline front you have, it's basically you can do uh, without a, each 400 square feet uh, is attainable if everybody does it because there's also a limit on the total coverage of all the citizens doing it at once. So somewhere between 400 square feet and half an acre is, is the individual limit. And, and during our, our meetings with the county and then our meetings with uh, the steering committee, there was some thought that the county could potentially, you know, purchase uh, burlap in bulk and other materials and then um, host workshops for landowners on uh, teaching and um, educating uh, folks on, on how to install these bottom barriers. And um, there's been a pretty successful program like that going on. Um, in Lake Ballinger and it, we think this coupled with the herbicide treatments could help reduce and control that uh, water lily population. Yeah, the thing about water lilies, it's, it's the roots that are there and you're you know, not necessarily gonna get them out by just hand pulling and, and digging them out, but it's also their um, seed bank uh, is viable for at least five to seven years. So you want to keep the cover going there for a little while until they start to death. Yeah, and, and I think I mentioned this earlier, but um, a recurring theme in our conversations with the steering committee was that um, there be an education plan and outreach to lake citizens, uh, lake residents and homeowners on, on what they can do. And so we, we put together um, some proposed strategies for an education plan, including potentially using volunteers at the boat launch to educate folks um, coming in from outside the community um, on providing education on cleaning and draining and drying your boat because uh, boats and boat trailers are one of the biggest vectors of all aquatic invasive species, plants and animals. Um, uh, one of the strategies uh, that was proposed was to work with the county to develop an outreach campaign, um, not only on providing information on the prevent, uh, prevention and um, introduction of aquatic species, but also uh, to educate residents on um, effective control methods that they can use on their own properties. And, um, and then there was some thought that there could be some additional signage at boat launches and parks and then um, also these workshops the, for the county and the community to host workshops that um, can provide information and control methods for individual landowners. So with that, um, does anyone have any questions? The next slide is the cost slide. And um, so we can move forward with that or, um, if anybody has any questions about a control strategy that they didn't see in the proposed um, tables or uh, would like some more information about, um, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Yep. Raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, you can talk about, yeah, again, strategies that are proposed in here are strategies that, again, were not recommended for proposal. I think uh, we've talked about a number of these in the past, uh, but this is uh, this plan has gone into a lot more detail on uh, a number of those. Uh, 
think everyone and wants to see how much all this costs. Eric, I cannot see folks, so I'm not sure if anybody has yeah, their I'm, hand up or not. Yeah, no, I've been looking and yeah, no one has their hand up. Uh, Becky has oh, her. No, Becky does. Yeah, Becky. go ahead, Becky. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. I almost forgot my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we know who's paying the two hundred million for the lake in Olympia? Do you know the name of the lake? Is it is it the Capitol Lake, the one yeah. by the Capitol? Yeah, Capitol Lake. I do not know who is paying for that. Yeah, Harry, do you have any information about that? No, no I don't. I hadn't heard of it. Um, I know that there's a, a big lake, Vancouver Lake, that is having a significant aquatic plant problem and, and they've been spending a lot of money on herbicides, but I don't I don't know about Capital Lake. Oh, I, I, I'll, I'll look it up. I think there's some articles uh, recently that have been out about it. So let, let me look it up, Becky, and I'll see if I can get you some kind of answer. Thank you. Let's uh, move on to Vivian. Hi, I um, uh, my mom actually owns a house on Long Lake. We're just a couple properties off of the boat launch. There's a lot of people that use that boat launch just to put their boats in the water and clean them off from the water, from the salt water, from being in the sound and coming in. So how do we, how do we, uh, can we like charge people for using that boat ramp and using our lake to to clean their boats off uh eric do you want to take a stab at that one um it, in general we have uh, the the boat launch is regulated on exactly what we can and can't do um charging folks for the use of the boat launch again it's not a county facility um, the state allegedly uh, collects uh, boat licenses and uh, those uh, kind of cover uh, the cost of the boat, boat launch. Um, and I think in general, uh, even if we were able to do it, the question was exactly how much we'd be able to charge to actually uh, and the administration costs related to it. That's where we have really focused on, again, highlighting education um, so that folks know that now you should not be doing this here um you should not be washing off uh your uh, uh yeah I, I think just in general um education is the best strategy that we could bring forward uh for the boat launch uh shannon is there anything i missed there or, or got wrong no i think that's exactly right um i believe it's a wdfw boat launch yes. um and um so at this conference that i was just at there was um a, a a guy, and I'd have to, I'll have to go back and look at his name, but um, who is the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for WDFW, and he brought several signs and um, uh, information that they, they've created some, some new educational materials, and um, I think that you may be able to, to contact WDFW and, and get some additional signage um, or, you know, sometimes they have on the boat ramps, you know, clean, drain, dry, uh, stenciling that you can paint. Um, it, but it's really, I think, going to take, you know, bo boater education through, through maybe the community and, and volunteers of the community um, at the boat launch, which, which is, you know, not an easy thing to do or coordinate, but um, but Eric's right. I think a lot of it is just education, education, education. Dana, your turn. Answer to Vivian. I just looked up Capital Lake. It looks like they're going to restore it to an estuary again, opening a 500 foot barrier out to the sound. So, and then do some boardwalks and stuff. So, like, they're going to turn it back into part of Puget Sound. Yeah, I think they're uh, looking to turn part of it into a park. It's, it looks like it's being funded in part by the Port of Olympia and um, the uh, uh, state of Washington. Yep. 
But again, uh, yeah, they definitely are not focused on uh, maritime activity or recreation, which I think they may be doing exactly what we're trying to do the opposite of. Yep. That's all I had. All right. So uh, let's get to the costs. Um, as I'm sure uh, you can imagine, um, the cost of everything is skyrocketed. Um, these are costs uh, based on current estimates and current projects that have occurred within the last couple of years. Um, because of inflation and cost of materials, uh, this is twice as much as what was estimated 10 years ago uh, to deal with aquatic vegetation management in Long Lake. Um, we've broken it out in a five-year cycle because that is uh, what's typically done for these types of plans. And it's also the length of an aquatic management, a uh, plant management permit. Um, and so the uh, curly leaf pondweed hand diving about 20K a year at the beginning. And then you hope costs decrease uh, as the infestation decreases. Um, you've got Brazilian Elodea herbicide the lily herbicide treatment, the bottom barrier materials, um, outreach and education. And then you also have to include project management and permitting. The permit does cost money and it um, costs money to have somebody ad administer the permit and take care and, and implement this plan. Um, so we're estimating um, at this point in time about $130,000 a year to just $100,000 to like year four and five at about $100,000 a year. But again, this is just for plant management and does not cover management for toxic algae or, or nutrient management. And so, um, uh, and, and, you know, continued work is, is necessary as we, as we saw, we, you had some great um, effectiveness during 2006 to 2010, and then there was a large gap where there was no management and the plants um, got worse. So um, this is a long-term ongoing kind of situation. And, um, and so this plan gives you a tool and, um, and lots of tools to use uh, and go forward. So I hate to ask, but does anybody have any questions about the costs? And I'll let Eric answer them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Becky. Uh, you're on mute, Becky. Sorry, I'm new at this. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you great. Um, outreach and education, $10,000. Who? Where is that going exactly? Um, so that was to um, cost to coordinate volunteers at the boat launches to develop an outreach campaign um, and uh, put on a workshop for landowners on various different control methods um, and to purchase uh, signage to put at uh, additional signage to put at the um, boat launches, as well as the park and any sort of public access point. Hmm. Seems like a lot and bottom barriers and, oh, I don't know. It, is this something similar to what we paid in the last five years or is this for the next five years or is there something you can show us where the money went for the last five years, like a spreadsheet or something? And we currently have all the invoices of all the money that was uh, spent uh, posted on the county website. We are working on a spreadsheet that makes it a little more uh, user friendly. Uh, but yeah, every penny that's been expended, uh, again, largely that has gone to uh, um, vegetation treatments uh, pretty much every year, but then one alum treatment. If you take a look at the budget that was originally approved with the Lake Management District, almost half of the, I think, $497,000 that was uh, to be raised and expended 
Uh, almost half of that went to the alum treatment that happened in the second year of treatment um, because alum is that expensive. Alum is the treatment that, that deals with algae. Um, and uh, that uh, it, it, it's one of those uh, things that it continued alum treatments jack up the cost really, really high. Basically 589,000 is about 100,000 more than he spent the in the last five years. And this plan here would not necessarily cover algae. Um, that doesn't mean that th these aren't excellent opportunities. What it does mean is that both alum and vegetation treatment has skyrocketed in cost for the exact reason that Shannon put forward. Shannon, anything to add there before we move on to someone? I think someone else had their hand up. No, I've had several projects, um, alum treatment projects this year be postponed because of the unheard of increased in cost. Um, at the beginning of this year, alum increased by, you know, 55, 60%. Um, and it, some of it was because of the Ukraine and Russian conflict and the metals market around the world and it's it's supply and demand and um, we heard from some uh, suppliers of herbicides at the conference that they just don't have enough they can't they can't get it they can't get it to the the lake associations that would normally use it and it's just it's kind of all a mess right now it seems like unfortunately Any other questions regarding these? Again, this is focused on vegetation. Uh, after we get through this presentation, I believe Dana is going to talk uh, about uh, SIL's upcoming conversations about uh, how to proceed forward with lake management. Again, with uh, the lake management district having ended this year, um, we are going to move into another period where there is no treatment going on in the lake, um, which again was very detrimental from 2010 to 2018 as Shannon and uh, Harry laid out. Yeah, and I've only got a few more slides, so I want to make sure that Syl has time. So let's uh, let's keep going. Um, this slide just again brings up that native plants. Um, as you reduce the non-native invasive species, you know that the native plant species will increase. Um, it's just given the morphology of your lake the shallowness of it. Um, this has occurred historically. And so you you may as a community have to have to look at um, potentially having to manage native plants. And unfortunately, that is not something that the state of Washington promotes or um, provides funding for. And so um, it's it's going to kind of be one of those things where you got to keep it on the back of your of your radar um, and understand that you know, native plants are good and they're very beneficial for the lake, but they can get to a point where they become a nuisance and are out of control. Um, real quick, you know, there's unfortunately in our state, there's a lot of states that I work in that have state funded um, lake programs and um, they have a, a tax basis where they, where they have lots of um, funding but unfortunately, in Washington State, we don't have that. We, um, we are fortunate enough to have the one program that we do have, the um, Aquatic Invasive Plant Management Grant Program. And um, as we mentioned earlier, you can apply for an implementation grant if you have a plan that is complete. Um, it's $100,000 maximum, 75% uh, grant, and it requires a 25% match. And so um, you can reapply after the initial two years, but it becomes less competitive. Um, then, uh, so that really is the, the, the main grant funding piece that we have in our state. Uh, there, there may be um, grants available through WDFW and um, for invasive species um, control and, and possibly something to look into for, for signage at the boat launches. They're really focused on, on the animals, on the zebra mussels and quagga mussels. 
but you know, um, the same principles of clean, drain, dry apply to plants as well. Um, the other funding um, mechanism would be something that you have done in the past, a lake management district or lake association fees. Um, so uh, just in conclusion, the next steps for the community, um, hopefully read or you know, skim through the draft plan. Please provide comments um, to, to Eric um, on the draft plan. Uh, we, we have to have the plan finalized into ecology mid-ish November. Um, so if you can provide any comments, you know, in the next few days, um, that would be great. And then um, you've already attended this virtual public meeting. So good job. Uh, it, we really appreciate your, um, your uh, willingness to sit in. And, and, and lose one of your free evenings to, to listen um, about to us uh, talk about the plan. So uh, the next steps for the county, um, after the meeting, uh, review the public comments and incorporate them into the draft. Uh, we finalize the plan and submit it to the Department of Ecology for review and approval, and then apply for um, the implementation grant which if successful would be available, I believe in July, funding becomes available in July of 2023. But again, that implementation grant is, would only provide a fraction of the money, um, but it would be something. So um, with that, uh, I wanna thank the steering committee um, we've, we had some good meetings. They provided valuable input and insights and um, this, this whole plan process couldn't have been done without them. And then um, my email is there at the bottom, shannon.bradabo at tetratech.com as well as Eric's email. Um, please feel free to direct any questions um, to either of us. So yeah. And in general, uh, uh, continuing to review the plan, review again the recommendations that have been made. For, that, that have been made. Um, honestly, it's, it's the comments on the things that are being recommended and the things that have not been recommended. That'll be very valuable. We do want to get this draft plan into the Department of Ecology so that we can apply for that grant. And while it is uh, only about a hundred thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand of which is matched. That is money that would give us uh, something to do, some money to apply potentially in 2023 uh, to help continue with some plant management, hopefully with one of the recommendations that have been made here tonight. So with that, do we have any questions about the plan? Uh, we uh, would be uh, we're hoping to get uh, comments uh, no later than uh, probably the middle of next week so we can actually uh, finalize the draft plan. So with that, any other questions on this? And once we complete that, we will be turning this over to Dana Soya to talk about uh, SIL's upcoming uh, plans for community discussions. Becky. I'm just curious, is any of this stuff we're putting in the lake, is there anything we can do to address the snail population invasion? <laughs> I mean, they're big ones about the size of a walnut, some of them. Uh, I don't really know much about snails, Harry. <laughs> uh, they, uh, uh, go ahead, Eric. Are, are, they, are, are they more in one area of the lake or another? I actually have not encountered the snails. Maybe, um, hmm? um, maybe they're just on our beach. I don't know, but. But they seem to be a little, there weren't quite as many this year, but in the past couple years, they've been just awful thick. You could see them like a, almost a carpet on the uh, underwater sometimes. When the water's clear, you could see them. But, hmm. And then they wash up on the beach and they stink. And so I was just curious what we could do to help eradicate them. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll look into the snail question. David? Yeah, and it, it may be worth getting um, contacting uh, WDFW. The, the guy's first name was Brian. I cannot remember his last name, but he's the new 
uh, invasive species coordinator, and he would definitely um, have some thoughts and suggestions, I think, and would also be able to help you identify them. Moving on, David. So the plan sounds great. And it's, you know, something, something is better than nothing. So that's great that you guys are pushing this forward. Say we get the funding. I guess what's next? Do we go through another vote to get support from residents? Or is that what Dana is talking about next? That's about it. You're queuing up Dana quite well. Um, so yeah, I believe that's what Dana's gonna to wanna to talk about here in a moment. Uh, do we have any other questions regarding the plan? Uh, or exactly what uh, we're hoping to achieve over the course of the next month. So this grant is, is the county matching with 75%? Is that coming out of the Lake Management District or is that still money we're, we're putting in? Um, at, at this point, if we, right now, um, if we were to apply for the grant, uh, we would be looking at to achieve the $75,000 and the county would then have to wrestle with how to come up with the $25,000. Obviously, if there was a lake management district in place, there might be an opportunity for some overlap. Uh, if there isn't, then uh, the county has to uh, find uh, $25,000 to apply to it. Um, and then on top of that, there is the administration that goes that goes into this. Um, that's one of the things that we will need to discuss in any future lake management district is how we handle uh, administration of the grant or administration of the overall program. Okay. Very good. All right. With that, uh, Dana, right. do you want me to leave this leave this up, or do you have a presentation to share? No, just open up for Q&A and kind of want to express my feelings on where I think we need to go and what we need as far as support and building a coalition to get this pushed through because I, you know, there's um, tough times out there right now. So we need all hands on deck to formulate a plan to get everybody on board or the majority of people on board, I know. Some people will never step up, but we did it before, but times are a little different this year. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. All right. With that, Dana, it's your, it's your show. So looking at, as I just mentioned, been getting some feedback. A lot of people, you know, Becky's expressed some concerns and things like that. And uh, we've been getting some nasty grams and people aren't feeling that they've seen enough progress. You know, it's so hard to quantify that because you don't know. In other words, where would we be if we did nothing? You know, and if the lake, the weeds are kind of on a march right now, just think if they weren't kept in check, where would we be? You know, so it's very difficult and I've been chewed out for this before, but I try to make it logical, like the housing developments at McPherson Glen or Land Summit or McCormick Woods or you know any new home development has a homeowners association. Well, we don't have entryways into the plat. We don't have street lights to maintain things like that. But this lake is our homeowners association. If your neighborhood looks ratty, your property values go down. The one behind the old roller rink, that was a beautiful new development put in. And I was shocked. I went through there a couple of years ago. It's been a while since I've been back up there. I think the name of the street blocking board, I think. Um, and their HOA went down and the homes, some are painted horribly. There's yards in this, there's cars on blocks. You know, it's just a mess. Long Lake is our HOA, and if we have to spend, you know, give up a half a cup of Starbucks coffee a day to fund it for the year, we need to get everybody in that mindset because it's not much money when you look at either you're going to make money or you're going to lose money. If this lake, I'm in real estate, I've been with Windermere for 30 years, and I've seen what degradation can do. And if, if this lake goes down, your property value is going to drop considerably. You know, if you improve it, you're going to make money. 
and I know it's not all about money, and I know things are difficult right now, but we mow our grass or we hire people to cut our grass if we don't want to do it. What's that doing? It's maintaining your property value. Well, we have a big lawn in front of our houses. It's 480 acres and it's um, it needs attention. And I'm trying to get everybody in the mindset that number one, it's a beautiful asset. We're blessed to live there, but, and people are gonna use it that aren't gonna pay for it. But just like people that live on salt water, people can walk up and down their beach. It's a Washington State beaches are an open easement. You know, and people can come into the lake and use it. It'd be nice if we could get some type of a fee, but that's probably never going to happen. You know, it'd be nice to set up a regional taxing district, put a little money on the noxious weeds, that'll take care of Long Lake, the Kitsap, um, Horseshoe Lake, Y Lake, you know, if they need help, some type of a system to do that. But, you know, we got, to get some feedback and I'd like to, I was thinking November, but we just don't have enough time. Well, Thanksgiving coming and Christmas, people are gonna be scatterbrained and running around, but maybe in January, hold a community meeting so people can vent their concerns and we can put proposals that will hopefully, you know, it'd be nice to get this thing funded for 10 years. Instead of coming back five years, when, we're just getting going, but you know, look at this plan, look at other plans, make sure we get it right. If this needs tweaking, you know, looking at controlling the Brazilian um, LED is 225 acres. Should we just attack that versus the fragrant water lilies for 80 acres and the, the curly leaf and get rid of the big one first and then? win that battle and then move on to the other ones. You know, people are saying it's not realistic that you're going to get rid of it all, but it can we do it? You know, are there treatments out there? And I think Harry mentioned that, you know, you can only do so much, but I've been looking at other treatment plans and I've seen big lakes that have been cleaned up in a year or two. So I don't know where the limits are with the Department of Ecology and you know, can you get a Marshall Plan or uh, all hands on deck to get some of these limitations weighed so we can get it under control? Because controlling it, we need to eliminate it. And it might cost more money, like it points out here for the first couple of years, you know, we do a um, $750 deal and then maybe towards the end of the treatment thing, it might be only $350 a year. But to look at getting this under, not only under control, but getting rid of it, you know, and eliminating it as much as possible, then it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to control it. You know what I'm saying? And I'm no biologist like Harry and stuff like that, but so I'm going to talk about getting, looking at different treatment plans and, you know, the 225 acres, the south end, is that causing a lot of, issues down late because everything dumps out of the north end. So it's the south end leaching seeds and weeds and milfoil and things drifting down the lake to get to Kearney Creek to get out to the, the bay. You know, how's the ecosystem of this lake actually working? And can we nip it in the bud to, to eliminate transfer of seeds and weeds and things? And, you know, so these are things I want to look at, and Harry could probably provide some insight. Maybe I'm dreaming. I don't know. But, you know, I'd like to look at other options and stuff, too, because they made note that, you know, this is the plan that we're submitting is um, um, not casting stone. You know, it's not the final plan. The one we're submitting is a draft for review so we can apply to get the grant. So you know, we want to look at all our options and really dive into this because I think control, we want to eliminate it and then we can control it. So uh, my proposal is I've got to run it by uh, people. We have a little money in sale to rent the Long Lake Community Hall and have a big meeting, have some cookies and coffee and try to get people on board and get the positive 
and the negative feedback, but I appreciate David um, agreeing that, you know, it's a good plan. We got to do something and keep this thing going because one step forward, two steps back, you know, these leads are on the march. And if we let them expand, it's going to cost us more down the road to nip it in the bud and get it to back to where it was, let's say, 2020. We don't do anything until 2023, excuse me, 2022. We don't do anything until 24, 25. What's going to happen the next two summers, you know? So I don't know if that makes sense, but I think we need to educate, get people out. Um, I had a lapse and real estate was crazy and I didn't see we need to renew the SIL domain name because I couldn't log on to it and found out that we didn't renew our thing. So I've got, I submitted payment for that. So we'll have the Long Lake SIL website back up. But you know, we also have Facebook, Long Lake owners, things of that nature. But I'd like to advertise this open house and I'm open for feedback maybe since we're all here and we can get the steering committee the middle of January or something to get a community meeting together in person. I like, and I'm an old timer. I like to be in front of people instead of the screen. Any uh, questions or comments? I think um, from the county's perspective, uh, again, having kind of a community discussion, kind of going back to some of the community coordination that was done back in 2014 before the formation of the original uh, Lake Management District to see exactly where people are in uh, thinking about how what we've been doing the last five years. And again, taking a look at information like this, any other information that Dana may be getting from other places and being able to bring that forward for kind of a discussion on how to on how to move forward and whether there is an appetite for a lake management district. Ken. Hi, first I want to apologize for not having a video. For some reason, my camera's not working. Um, three things real quick. First, I want to um, Thank everybody, the steering committee, uh, Tetra Tech and the county for working on this. Um, I'm with Dana. I think this is a very important asset that we have in the community and needs to be taken care of. Um, it's, to me, it's kind of like a lawn. You buy a new house, you don't have a lawn, you put a lot of money in that lawn. And then after a while, it doesn't take very long and it doesn't take very much to maintain it. But if you let it go, the weeds take over and now you're right back to step one. So I think we need to get ahead of this and I think we need to stay on top of it. Um, I, I do have a quick question regarding the, the management plan. Uh, I, as, you, as you said that uh, Allen is kind of a wild card uh, on price, but uh, my understanding is um, if we take care of the plants, the plants die, decompose, and then they release phosphorus back into the water column. And doesn't that create an algae issue? I mean, years ago, they, they, you know, killed, they had the previous lake manager um, a group took care of the plants. The lake was, uh, uh, they, the plants died, released phosphorus, then they had a huge algae problem. Then they, they took care of the algae problem. The lake was nice and clear, so the site would get down to the plants and the plants grew. So, um, working with uh, Harry and Tetra Tech, they came up with an excellent plan, in my opinion, um, over the years to, to manage it. And so I'm wondering why um, the, the phosphorus um, and the algae component is uh, not part of this. I would think that if they take care, if you take care of the plants, the plants are gonna decompose and then you're gonna have an algae problem. The uh, grant source that uh, paid for this uh, is only, can be only be focused on vegetation. Um, it, it doesn't allow you to to address algae, but you are entirely correct that um, the the death of uh, vegetation leads to additional phosphorus and nutrients, which then leads to algae blooms, which is why over the last five years, people have always kind of asked, well, why don't you just kill more weeds? It's like, well, if you kill more weeds, you're going to end up with an algae bloom. Um, at times, there are certain people on the lake who are more concerned about weeds than the algae. Um, I think likely a holistic uh, lake management program uh, is going to need to focus on both. 
Um, but uh, the, what you see in the plan today is really kind of focused on how you could go about uh, addressing the vegetation in ways that don't necessarily kill vegetation all the time. I think the uh, burlap uh, strategy as well as the diver strategy doesn't end up with vegetation dying in the lake. Uh, it does, or, or if it does die in the lake, it, it dies one time and one time only. Um, I think it's those types of strategies that could be valuable in uh, helping avoid algae blooms as we start to get the vegetation uh, under control. I see Shannon turned her video on. Shannon, is something you'd like to add or better yet, correct if I've said something wrong? No, I think we have taught you well. That was the perfect answer. Um, mm -hmm. There is, the, I think that that balance is why there are limits in the permit to how much of the littoral area you can treat at one time. Um, and, it, and it is a delicate balance between plants and algae. If you have nutrients in the system, um, you will have one or the other. And so the, the goal is to try and manage them both holistically and together. And, and that's really challenging and hard to do. Um, the, the funding for the IAVMP though, as Eric said, is focused on um, aquatic plant management. And so I think both Harry and I recognize that you, you really have to be careful and about how many acres you treat and some of the methods that you choose because um, you, you can you know, trigger a, a release of phosphorus into the water column and then a, an algae bloom. Oh, Harry, do you have anything to add? Maybe he left. No, I'm, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> uh, no, I, th I think you're, uh, sorry about the phone ring. Um, Ken's, Ken's perspective, I really agree with, and, and Eric and Shannon, your, your explanation's been good. And um, so I, I agree with that. The, the key thing that Ken brought up is that the long term beyond this grant and what we've done because of the limitation of the grant, you have to look at a balance between how do we limit the nutrients so we don't have the algae problem and how do we uh, eliminate the invasive species so they don't go after us uh, and, and ruin the lake. The point is you have both problems. You have to do it in conjunction together and, and do that. And the, the other point is to do, you know, um, go after it big right away is a wonderful way to do it. It's just that the cost is gonna be there because the cost for everything has gone up. Uh, and so the more you do it once, the faster you do it, the less the long-term cost will be and the more the benefits will be for that time. So it's kind of, um, these are the discussions that you, you all have to have because um, it's expensive. But on the other hand, um, if you don't, your assets are gonna diminish. I mean, that's, you know, the lake is part of your assets and it reflects in your property value and it will go down. I mean, like Grand Lake St. Mary's, um, in Ohio, I bought a house for two and a half million and the price went up to six million. Then the lake started to bloom a lot. And he tried to get a loan for half a million to do some upgrades and the value had gone down to less than 200,000. It's real. Yeah, yeah and in the plan there is an adaptive management section and the reason why the plan is so detailed and includes so many um, different options and strategies is you you can change right everything changes and so if you continue to do monitoring and surveying and and you see that something is not working or or something is working really well you have the ability to to adapt and and make changes to the plan it's a living document Ken, did you have a follow-up question? No, it was more of a, um, a statement where uh, talking about educating folks at the boat launch, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife 
were uh, when they regraded and upgraded the regraded the, the gravel and upgraded the boat launch. Um, Sil was in talks with them to put together a, a um, informational kiosk, uh, and the gentleman that we were talking to went on to somewhere else, and we lost that contact. Um, so if anybody wants to re-engage with fish and wildlife, um, I'm pretty sure they're still uh, willing to help us put a kiosk in. Um, I'm sure that we're going to have to flip the bill for the kiosk and put all the information on it, but they'll give us the permission to, to, to do that. Great. Let's take, uh, as we have, we've crested eight o'clock, uh, why don't we take uh, one or two more questions? Um, anybody have an opposition to an in-person meeting either at the lake, uh, at the Long Lake Community Center, or not community, so Long Lake uh, Park, or at the uh, Kids of County Administration Building? All right. Well, in which case, Dana, why don't you talk to some of the well, oh, wait, we got two. I can't see. Let's go with Becky first. And then, can you still have your hand up? We'll go with you next. I think a meeting would be great, but I think if we did it down at the park, at that building, we'd get a lot more um, people. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Okay, other questions or Dana, do you want to kind of get together with uh, your uh, SIL members to kind of think about what time would be best uh, for such a meeting, probably after the holidays, I think is what you proposed. And I can work with Commissioner Garrido, uh, maybe SIL and Commissioner Garrido can get together and kind of talk about uh, how that the meeting would work out maybe sometime before the end of the year. Sounds good. I'm going to be gone for Thanksgiving, but I'll be around the rest of the year. So. All right, well, uh, send me some dates. I'll work uh, with uh, Commissioner Garrido's calendar and we will move from there. Beautiful. All right, well, I really want to thank everybody for spending their time with us tonight. Um, again, I think the plan is a piece of the puzzle. It is not the whole puzzle. Um, it is important for us to uh, have that uh, as uh, educational material for the discussions and uh, also to hopefully access some uh, money. There's no such thing as free money, but it would be a, a nice amount of money for us to continue efforts uh, while we kind of sort out, will there or won't there be a, a future lake management district? So I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I really want to thank Shannon and Harry and the members of the steering committee who have worked so hard over the last two years um uh, on this plan and uh we really uh, look forward to additional comments between now and hopefully sometime next week to get into the draft plan appreciate your time eric and hope everybody and have a good night good night everybody thank you bye-bye thanks